Welcome to episode 36 of the GT on 5G. It's the latest inside scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend coming to you from Kansas City, Missouri this week. And joining me again is fellow analyst, Angel Sag. Let's get started with my first topic. And it's around Ongo Wireless and the CBRS Alliance. So there was an announcement this week that the CBRS Alliance is actually rebranding itself, the Ongo Alliance, the reason why it's doing that is it's going to extend um, all of its learnings on a global basis. So if you've been following CBRS or Citizens Band Radio Service, um, they have been instrumental in driving um, the, uh, the whole notion of shared spectrum with that repurposed naval spectrum. And so they've been, they've been at this for quite a while. I've covered them. We've talked about them in prior podcasts, uh, also written about them on Forbes as well. And so they're gonna extend those learnings on a global basis. That's part of the rebranding. And you know, what does that mean for, for the acceleration of private networking? I think it's only goodness because they're gonna bring a lot of learnings from the US. It's no secret that you know, other parts of the world, when you look at Europe and you look at Asia, they're looking at similar scenarios um, to provide you know, broader access of license spectrum to entities beyond carriers. And so I think this is a super positive thing. So I'd love to get your thoughts on it as well. Um, I, I think it's positive, but I think it's more of a marketing thing than anything else. Interesting. Um, I think them going international is, is a bigger deal than, them, than, than the branding of it. Um, but I think it does make it easier uh, for people to recognize a similar, you know, potentially global marketing name for the technology. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think, you know, they are going to bring a lot of learning. So I, I get what you're saying. Um, you know, I think, you know, countries can figure this out on their own, but um, this stuff is quite difficult. And um, it's, it's no secret that uh, because the CBRS Alliance, which is, you know, now on go wireless, had to learn to work with government entities and like multiple government entities, when you think about the DOD and you think about the FCC, uh, that there were a lot of learnings there that can be that can be shared with other parts of the world. So um, I, I think it's gonna help accelerate things. I think it's a positive, um, you know, thing that's, uh, that's happened here and we'll keep our eyes on it and see how things develop. But let's move to your first topic this week. And uh, UCLA released um, their findings and AT&T is making a claim, right? Yeah, so UCLA parent company of speedtest.net, which is uh, the app that most people use to you know, test the speed of their internet connection, either be it at home or on their phones, uh, came out with uh, an updated version of their speed test global index. And they found that um, AT&T was the fastest network uh, combined for both 4G and 5G. And uh, part of how they calculate this is by a, an aggregate score. It is not a um, megabits per second number. Um, they do actually measure um, speeds. So uh, they found that at at t that they had speeds uh, upwards of 67 megabits per second on average in December. Mm -hmm. um, but what that does is it actually um, generates a score. And the score was that at and had a speed test score of 75.59, which combines 90% of download and 10% of upload. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a weighted score. Yeah. Um, and, and what it's saying is it's they weight download as 90% of the score and upload as 10%, which you know may not necessarily agree with, but that's how they're doing it, um, which can actually affect what those end results look like in terms of who's fastest. Um, but what's interesting is at t took first place with T-Mobile taking second and Sprint now part of T-Mobile taking third and Verizon taking fourth. And wow. the reason why this is a big deal is because Verizon slipped quite a bit um, because of their deployment of their um, new 5G low band using DSS, which mm -hmm. a lot of people have reported has not been very fast and has actually been slower than 4G, which severely hurt their score. Uh, and AT&T has been, you know, kind of came out of the gate pretty quick 
um, I recall getting 200 to 300 megabits per second on their initial rollout. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like they've been able to maintain those top end speeds while also improving their low end speeds even more. And it seems like this has kind of been what's pushed them into this number one spot as far as um, UCLA is concerned. Um, but the reality is their coverage is still not as good as T-Mobile's. Yeah. And their peak speeds uh, in theory, are as good as AT and T, um, as good as Verizon's, because they also have millimeter wave, but it's in very few places. And Verizon kind of owns millimeter wave as far as coverage and availability, but that's still less than one percent uh, nationwide coverage. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be interesting to see over the course of this year um, who makes um, you know performance claims, coverage claims, and and see who really comes out on top because. I, I think that's going to be changing over the course of this year as, as more of the 5G networks mature. Yeah, I agree. There, and there's so many moving parts to this, right? You know, the use of DSS, are we talking low band, mid band, or millimeter wave? And gotcha. it seems, yeah, it seems like they're, you know, the, the, the pole position changes almost on a, on a quarterly basis. And, and certainly I expect, you know, AT&T and, you know, Verizon kind of exiting that, C-band auction that we've talked about on a couple previous podcasts um, to start deploying those assets, um, but you know that'll take time, obviously, and that's going to affect overall you know speed ratings and that sort of thing. So, you know, it seems like you know that there's there's a different winner every quarter, but uh, but hey, it's it's a barometer, right? And so uh, something that we'll keep our eyes on. So let me move to my second topic this week, and uh, Nokia and China Mobile conducted a trial applying artificial intelligence to China Mobile's radio access network. And what China Mobile is branding is something called, I'm gonna read it here, iWireless Intelligent and Simplicity 5G Network concept. And you know the way that I interpret that is they're just looking for ways to better optimize um, the radio access network part of the deployment. That's where the rubber really meets the road, talking about upload and download speeds uh, that we were discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. um, one of the stats that was um, quoted, and you know, forgive me for reading off my smartphone here, but this was done in Shanghai. <clears throat> it said the trial confirmed that um, the, the traffic prediction accuracy exceeded 90%. They trialed this in a live 5G network. And if you think about that, that's incredible when you start talking about tactile operations, when you start talking about telemetry for autonomous driving and that sort of thing. So you know, from my perspective, it is a trial. They use the live network, but the results are very promising. What are your thoughts? Um, I haven't really seen much about that in terms of implementing AI with the RAN, yeah. um, but it sounds like it's something that's kind of a fledgling technology. Um, and sure. it'll be interesting to see how that actually gets implemented uh, in a commercial network. Yeah, it will. We'll keep our eyes uh, peeled and we'll report back as things develop there. Um, why don't we move to your second topic this week? And I know, didn't you attend a media tech analyst event? I think you've got some news to share there. Yeah, so this week we actually uh, got two announcements for chipsets uh, for 5G devices. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was actually a kind of small announcement, which was the uh, Snapdragon 870 announcement which from Qualcomm, yeah. from Qualcomm, and that's a kind of a refresh of the 865 plus, which is really designed to give OEMs some flexibility in what they decide to use, whether it's a Snapdragon 888, which has 5G built in with the Snapdragon X60 modem, or the 870, which is going to be with an 850, X55. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of a, kind of a ho-hum one. The big one was really coming from MediaTek where they announced the Dimensity 1100 and 1200. Uh, those are not actually chips that have 5G modems built in. Uh, they will leverage um, MediaTek's modems, which currently is an M70. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's gonna be a two chip solution, but it, those, those, both of those chipsets, I would fully expect to kind of be what's uh, the lead 5G chipset um, for MediaTek and their partners. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about how MediaTek is gaining momentum in terms of market share and that they're number one 
in terms of market share against Qualcomm. And they've been the ones who have actually managed to uh, take advantage of the Huawei situation with um, some of their supply constraints and, and, and right. having issues with getting enough devices out there. So it seems like MediaTek has really taken the biggest uh, advantage of the current situation because Qualcomm can't supply Huawei yeah. um, and a lot of MediaTek's partners are competitors to Huawei. And I think they've been, they're the ones who really benefited from the situation. Yeah, so tremendous upside for MediaTek. Let me ask you this because you're very knowledgeable on this point. Do you feel like MediaTek still has the same sort of breadth and depth that Qualcomm has? I mean, you've talked about Qualcomm's capabilities to supply the very high-end, mid-range and low-end handsets. Do you, do you see MediaTek's roadmap sort of marrying up to that or are they just you know kind of opportunistically you know taking some share because of uh, the China versus US um, debate? Well I think they wouldn't have been able to take advantage of the situation if they didn't have chips like the Dimensity 1000 last year which okay. came pretty close to competing with Qualcomm and this mm -hmm. new 1100 and 1200 chips are designed to compete with the Snapdragon 888. However, I'm not really sure they will actually be able to beat it in terms of performance on any measurement, what be it 5G, CPU, GPU. I think it'll come close, but I don't think it will be the leader necessarily. So it basically has to be the chipset, which has kind of been MediaTek's play is it's a value. Um, you get a lot of performance for the dollar, um, but you might not necessarily get the best performance. Um, and that won't necessarily bode well for them at the very high end, but it will do well for them in the mid range, which is a very popular category today. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we're gonna see Qualcomm trying to be competitive uh, with the Dimensity 1100 and 1200 chipsets uh, when we'll probably see products coming soon that will be very close in terms of price performance and offer something similar, but it's, it's getting competitive and it's a good thing to see. Yeah, no competition you know, spurs innovation and it keeps, uh, it keeps companies honest with pricing. So I think it's definitely good. I mean, AMD has proven that with uh, their competition with Intel. Um, let's move to my third topic this week. And I want to talk about Verizon. Um, they announced a partnership with Unity. This is an area that you cover, right? Unity is uh, basically the platform that's used for AR and VR and mixed reality development. And um, the relationship really further extends what Verizon's really been focused on lately, which is mobile edge compute. There've been a flurry of announcements. We've covered some of these on prior podcasts, but you know, Verizon is really doubling down and you know, you're starting to see the same thing from, from oper other operators as well on mobile edge computing. <clears throat> so what does this mean for consumer and enterprise 5G services? So you know, it's no secret that mobile edge computing can supercharge um, the capability of these, these new 5G networks. You know, certainly from a consumer perspective, um, you know, mobile gaming, that's, that's obvious low hanging fruit. But, you know, I've spoken to really compelling use cases in the enterprise that can leverage, you know, mixed reality, such as augmented, um, you know, field service and, you know, that sort of thing. And being able to overlay, you know, schematics and that sort of thing when field technicians are actually making repairs to speed repairs and, and you know, and that sort of thing. And that's only one application, but, I think this is a further step in the right direction, marrying mixed reality with mobile edge computing to sort of supercharge these 5G use cases. So curious to hear your thoughts as well on it. Well, I have actually written a paper for Unity before on, on right. some, yeah. some topics, but uh, the reality is Unity is a very popular game engine. I don't mean to call it, a, I call it a world engine now, okay. but so many applications developers use Unity on a daily basis that they're very familiar with the Unity platform. Mm -hmm. And I think that Unity's ease of use is ultimately what will be good for Verizon's because application developers that are familiar with Unity will already be in that environment and will be able to deploy their applications within Unity's ecosystem very easily for yeah. mobile edge compute. And so that they'll be able to think about their applications, not just how it runs on the device or how it runs on the cloud, but also how it runs on mobile edge compute. So I think it's a good thing because this is gonna make mobile edge compute applications easier to develop for. And I think that's really the big deal because right now it's, it's still very trial and error when it comes to building these applications for mobile edge compute. And I think having Unity partner with Verizon will be a good thing because you're going to need the applications to actually utilize a mobile edge compute for it to be worth anything. And 
Unity is a big opportunity for that. And the only other company I can think of that would be a similar impact would be somebody like uh, Epic Games. But there's pretty much two players in town when it comes to these, these game engines, if you call them that anymore, because so many movies, TV shows, like professional applications are now leveraging these game engines yeah. to make a virtual version of the real world. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and I have a, you know, I have a friend, you know, that, that works for a, you know, a game development company as well. And their applications for the military, right? Yep. You know, so, I mean, the, the applications are numerous. So when people think of a gaming engine, you know, don't think of Pokemon Go, you know, um, the, the extensibility of it is quite impressive. And, you know, and from my perspective, and I think you mentioned this already, um, this will really help accelerate uh, the delivery of, of new 5G services. And it's just going to, it's going to, you know, drive innovation. So I think it's pretty exciting. I think it's something that we'll definitely keep our eyes and, and you know, ears open to and report back as things develop. Let's move to your third and final topic this week. And you want to talk about a U.S. government initiative around 5G. Yeah, so it's a multi-effort. Well, first of all, it's a Department of Commerce effort. Um, and it's interesting because it was published uh, this week, 19th, which means it's basically the last days of the Trump administration. Yeah. Um, so the one thing is, I'm not really sure how much of this will be implemented. You know, there's some things that will carry over, um, but there will be some things that do not. So we don't even know whether or not this um, approach to 5, 5G infrastructure will be adopted. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty lengthy document. It goes about 40 pages. Um, and really there's like, I think there's, there's four key lines of effort that they're focused on, mm -hmm. which are to facilitate domestic 5G rollout, assess risks and identify core security principles of 5G infrastructure, address risks to US economic and national security during the development and deployment of 5G infrastructure worldwide, which is an important key, and yeah. to promote the responsible global development and deployment of 5G, which means that um, this is about not only how we roll out 5G in the US, but also how our allies do it and what those risks could mean to us economically and for security reasons. And it calls out um, a lot of technologies like RAN um, and there's tons of different organizations that have been referenced in it, um, literally a laundry list of them. But it's interesting because it takes into account DARPA, DHS, DOD, DOE, the FBI, the FCC, FDA. Yeah. So there, this is a very comprehensive document. There's way too much to cover in, in a period of um, a couple minutes here, but I would recommend that you go out to the uh, ntia.gov website and check it. And we'll include the, we'll include the link in the description for our video. Um, but basically it kind of talks about all the different things that I think are necessary to make 5G rollout secure and safe. And it doesn't feel political by any means. So it shouldn't be politicized at all. But it seems very reasonable in what it wants to accomplish. Um, and, it, and it kind of just goes through and mentions which agencies should be responsible for what components. And um, it, it seems like a pretty serious document. And it'll be interesting to see whether they carry this forward or build upon it um, or, or amend it um, with the new administration in charge. Yeah, well, it's no secret, you know, Chairman Pai has stepped down with the Trump administration having exited. Um, Jessica Rosenworcel, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, is the new interim FCC um, chief. Um, but hey, buddy, I'm curious, like, why the Department of Commerce and not the FCC? Um, so the commerce is because it's, the Department of Commerce has a um, an agency beneath it called the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. NTIA, okay, gotcha. Yeah, and NTIA is the one who actually drafted this document called the National Strategy to Secure 5G Plan. So this is an actual plan. This is not like a, a draft. This is an actual plan. Got so it. this is the policy or at least the policies that are going to drive decision making going forward unless somebody goes through it from new administration and decides that it's um, 
no longer necessary. But this is technically under the purview of the Department of Commerce because if you think about it, it makes sense. 5G will essentially be a huge driving force for the economy moving oh, forward. Sure. Yeah, and it'll yeah. be extremely important to maintain it, its security and viability for the economy to not be disrupted. Yeah, no, it makes sense. You know, we've, we've both talked about um, how 5G will certainly have a dramatic effect on, on GDP in a positive way. But I learned something new today. You know, the NTIA is uh, under the Department of Commerce. So should maybe get my, uh, <laughs> get educated a little bit more about how, you know, these things kind of line up, you know, uh, underneath uh, themselves. But uh, I agree with you on the surface. It doesn't seem political to me. It seems like it's a very sensible plan, very thought out, very thorough, a lot of time spent. Um, certainly the Trump administration was very um, supportive of accelerating 5G. There were other plans in the past, you know, the, there was the, the fast plan to 5G. And I think this is just sort of a continuation of that. So it'll be interesting to see how the incoming administration uh, picks up the 5G ball and rolls with it. So, but hey man, another great episode this week. Why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide insight on a specific 5G topic for us to cover on a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Willtown Tech and I'm at Anshel Sog. We hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week.